This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Blaspheme Boutique, a witchy boutique in Las Vegas, Nevada. Blaspheme Boutique features clothing, jewelry, books, oddities, mystical goods, readings, classes, and more. Having started on Etsy six years ago, the owner, Charlie Hanks, moved her handmade candles and hand screen printed apparel, along with goods from local artists, small businesses, and some dark brands, into a witchy little corner of Sin City in June of last year. Use code WITCHWAVE for 10% off any purchase on the website at blasphemeboutique.com. That's B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-E boutique.com. And you can follow them on Instagram or TikTok at Blaspheme Boutique. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Blessed Be Magic. Blessed Be Magic is a jewelry brand for the modern witch, creating subtle and tasteful talisman jewelry to remind you of your magic. You're a modern witch living in the real world. And maybe it's not that your lifestyle is a secret, it's just that you're not exactly flying around on a broomstick wearing a pointy hat. And you are not alone. It can be hard to find subtle, witchy jewelry that you feel comfortable wearing every day. But that's why Blessed Be Magic was born. With over 700 five-star reviews, these tasteful talismans are designed to be worn with your existing jewelry collection or on their own. The beauty is, Blessed Be Magic jewelry won't draw unnecessary attention to your secret beliefs. Plus, you'll get to wear a constant reminder of your magic every day. Visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, and magic is spelled with a C-K at the end, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. Check out Blessed Be Magic's modern take on classic magical symbols such as the Triple Goddess and Pentacle in their minimalist jewelry that you can wear every day, anywhere. Again, visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, that's magic with a C-K, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. It is April, which is a trickster of a month, as here in New York, at least, it can never seem to decide if it's really spring or still winter. As I record this here in Brooklyn, the sun is blazing and cherry blossoms are starting to burst open like floral fireworks. And yet the temperature is still in the 40s, and there's always the possibility of more snow. As you can probably tell, my body is also being a bit of a trickster right now, as I currently have what I am 99% sure is just a terrible case of allergies. Let's hope so. So apologies for my congested old crone voice today. But it's actually pretty appropriate for this episode because my guest, Madam Pamita, and I are going to be talking all things Baba Yaga, the great Slavic crone trickster witch herself. I also have a lot of fondness for April because it is National Poetry Month, 
So to get us in the mood for today's conversation, I'm going to read you a bit of one of my favorite poems by Sonia Vatomsky. This is from her poem, Ground Meat, from her dark and gorgeous book, Salt is for Curing. And ground meat begins like this. The witch lives in a house on chicken legs. Outside, she flies with mortar and pestle. She is perpetual motion because a woman cannot stop. I cannot stop. The forest around her is old chestnut stability. Trees wave her home with open arms. Trinkets droop from their limbs like pieces of forgotten lovers. The witch cooks love down in a pot. She feeds herself to herself. She grows stronger. Mmm, so good. Today's episode with witch and writer Madame Pamita is a delicious magical stew as well, in which we discuss Slavic witches and goddesses and Ukrainian magic, and oh my gods, you are in for such a feast. But before we get to that, first let's check and see what's come through on the witch wire. Who is it? Witches! Allie writes, I'm a longtime listener of the show. Thank you for bringing such joy to my life and bringing me back to magic. This past Beltane, I did a massive protection ritual for New Orleans for hurricane season in keeping with the traditional Celtic version of the holiday. We stated what we loved and wanted to protect. It was very powerful and left us with tears of gratitude. Now that the hurricane has passed and New Orleans has been spared the worst, I have complicated feelings. Did this ritual work? And if so, other communities that are often overlooked in surrounding areas have been hit very hard. Was it even right of me to demand that where I live be saved from spirit? Have I placed us above others, even when our ritual circle included many mentions of those more vulnerable than us? How do I sit with this strange feeling of guilt and gratitude mixed into one? Hi, Allie. First of all, let me say that I am so happy that your home was largely spared and that you and your loved ones are safe. Goodness knows New Orleans has been through enough. And of course you wanted to do a protective spell for yourself and your loved ones. Protective magic, or apotropaic magic as it's sometimes called, is one of the oldest and most common forms of magic that there is. It is so human. Actually, let me take that back because all organisms people, animals, plants, etc., want to protect themselves from harm. This is part of our nature, and fortifying ourselves through whatever means possible is an instinctual aspect of life. They call it the survival instinct for a reason. Spellcraft is one method of protection, one tool in your toolbox. I believe that spells amplify our intentions and energies and that they are complementary and supplementary to doing other things too, such as in the case of an impending hurricane, also making sure your windows are shut and that you have extra food and water on hand and batteries and all of the other ways in which we prepare for potential destruction. Asking spirit to protect you and your community is not selfish, nor do I believe that it takes away from anybody else. Spirit is expansive and infinite, and I don't believe that it operates by saying, well, I helped these people over here, so I better hurt these people over there to make up for it. So I hope that alleviates some of your guilt. 
But also remember that witches are masters at holding many opposites and truths together at once. Light and shadow. Life and death. So you can feel grateful that your home was spared and you can feel grief for those whose homes and lives were not. And you can also do whatever you are able to do to help those who weren't so fortunate. Not just because it's the right thing to do, which it is, but also as an offering an act of magical gratitude to spirit for granting you protection in this case. Here's another complicated truth for us to contemplate. No matter how much magic we do, sometimes terrible, unjust, destructive stuff is still going to happen in our lives and in the world. But our witchcraft can help us deal with all of that. As my friend and prior Witch Wave guest Sarah Faith Godestiner tweeted recently, quote, A spiritual slash magical practice doesn't stop hard or tragic things from happening. A spiritual slash magical practice helps you navigate the hard things with skill, grace, and support. Unquote. So Ali, I hope that makes you feel a little less guilty and a lot more grateful and much more supported and supportive of those who also need fortification. Now on to my guest. Madam Pamita is a Ukrainian diaspora witch teacher, author, candle maker, spellcaster, and tarot reader. Her new book, Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft, is filled with Slavic spells, rituals, and stories, and has a specific focus on Ukrainian magic. She has also written the Book of Candle Magic and Madame Pamita's Magical Tarot. She has a very popular YouTube channel for teaching witchcraft and two podcasts, and she is the proprietress of the online spiritual apothecary, The Parlor of Wonders. I absolutely adored this conversation, and I hope you will too. Madame Pamita joined me from her home in Santa Monica, California, via Zoom. Adam Pamita, welcome to The Witch Wave. Oh my gosh, Pam, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so overjoyed that you're here. As I said to you off mic, I have been wanting to talk to you for such a long time. And with your new book coming out, we have the perfect excuse. So welcome. Thank you so much. This is such an exciting adventure to meet with you and to talk with you because I've been a huge fan of yours and been collecting your books and your writing and you're so brilliant. And so this is exciting. It's a mutual fan club here. (laughs) You are making me blush. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, you and I have the rare experience of meeting another Pam. I feel like it's so rare that I meet people with my name. I know you call yourself Pamita. I would love to hear about the name Pamita and the different iterations of Pamela and Pam in your life. Oh my gosh. Well, I was born Pamela. So I was christened Pamela. That's my name. When I was growing up, I was Pammy. I don't know if you were ever a Pammy. I'm still a Pammy to my (laughs) loved ones. Absolutely. Yep. Then when I was a teenager, I told my mom, I will not answer to Pammy anymore. (laughs) I got really shirty about it, but... (laughs) I love the word shirty, by the way. (laughs) So good. How the name Pamita came about was that back in the 90s, I had an all-female surf band called the Neptunas. Fuck yeah. You know, garage rock and surf music. We added Ita to our name. Well, it started with my guitar player. She was Leslie. She became Leslita. I was Pam. I became Pamita. 
fast forward a few years, I got into 1920s music and I started doing a vaudeville show where I was reading tarot cards and doing music, doing jazz music from the 20s and the 30s. Since half of Los Angeles knew me as Pamita already, I just said, well, I'll just tack Madam on the front and be Madam Pamita. And there you go. So from that vaudeville show, that's where I started actually coming out with doing tarot readings. I had been doing tarot readings for decades for friends, but didn't really bring it out into the wider world. Music was the avenue for bringing that out. So then I became uh, Madame Pamita, but I answered to Pam, Pamela, Pammy, Pamita, all of it. Love it. Yeah. And I get very excited like you because there aren't a lot of Pamela's. And so when you meet one, it's almost like you get you get very mm-hmm. excited. Mm-hmm. It's the same feeling when I was a kid, a punk rock kid in the eighties. And I would look and I'd see another punk rock kid. <gasps> oh my gosh, we're in the same tribe. <laughs> totally. <laughs> when you see another witch. Yeah. Totally. That's exactly it. Although now there are all these TV shows with our name in it. There's like Pam and Tommy and the thing about Pam and all of that. And I'm not enjoying that as much. <laughs> no, I'm not this so excited about that. I want to meet Pam's in the wild, not a stereotype of a Pam for sure. <laughs> well, speaking of wild Pam's, you are currently focusing on one of the wildest characters or deities or demi deities that there is. This is someone that we know by name as either Baba Yaga or Baba Yaga. I've heard it pronounced both ways. What is your preferred pronunciation? Well, I say Baba Yaga when I'm speaking to English native speakers, because they're going to be more likely to understand what I'm saying and know what I'm saying. But I'm half Ukrainian. My other half is Scottish, English, Irish. Mm. That's my dad's side. My mom's side, Ukrainian. So when I speak to Ukrainians or Ukrainian speakers, I say Baba Yaha, which is the pronunciation in Ukrainian. And they know exactly who I'm talking about. But if I say that to English speakers, they're like, what, who, what? (laughs) So I say Baba Yaga when I'm speaking to English speakers. I love that. Now, I'm going to read a passage from the introduction of your gorgeous book, which is called Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft, Slavic Magic from the Witch of the Woods. And in the introduction, you write the following. When the famous Russian author Alexander Afan... Ooh, I'm going to let you do that one. (laughs) (laughs) Afanasyev. Afanasyev (laughs) collected the stories of the Russian peasants and created his book, Russian Folk Tales, in the mid-1800s. He selected just one of the hundreds of names for the Witch of the Woods. The beauty and magic he wove with his stories captured the imagination of the world, and the name he gave her was solidified in the public consciousness, Baba Yaga. So I didn't realize that he's the person who kind of codified that one name. And now we all, or or many of us, refer to the Witch of the Woods as Baba Yaga. But in the intro, you begin by writing all of these different names she has, and I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, my passion and my specialty is understanding Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian magic. But Slavic magic is all over, and Really, we have like Poland, Belarus, Bulgaria, Croatia. We have countries, Slovakia, Slovenia, a dozen or more Czech Republic, all kinds of countries that have Slavic heritage and Slavic stories. Now, understanding Ukrainian culture, going back, just like many of the cultures, you look at the Grimm brothers were recording the oral folk tales of the Germanic people. Mm -hmm. So Afanasyev did that with Russian stories. So he was writing down Russian stories. But because we see documentation of other names for her, Yezi Baba, Baba Yaga, spelled with an I, all kinds of names for her we see that she is really pan-Slavic and not Russian. She's been, I would say, misunderstood to be a Russian spirit, but she's not a Russian spirit. She's a pan-Slavic spirit. Mm. The fact that she is all over and under these different names going all over these different countries shows that she's very, very, very old, really preceding even the Slavic gods that came about in the early Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. We see her as this very, very ancient forest mother or forest grandmother spirit. If you go back far enough, you find her as that. So we find stories. There are stories where she's like an ogre. Mm. And the older stories, she's kind of an ambiguous gift giver. So you have to come get tested and then you get a gift from her. We see those older stories that show that. What that shows us about her is that she is someone who is an initiator. 
if you're doing an initiation, you get tested to see if you're worthy to proceed to the next level. Yes. And so she's this initiatory spirit. She's the spirit of the forest and nature. And so like all nature, nature can be gorgeous and beautiful and giving nature can also be dangerous and deadly and terrifying. So, yeah. Yeah. So like that, you would see her as this ambiguous spirit that you would make offerings like quid pro quo. If I give you something, then you'll bless me and protect me. And that's how many of the ancient spirits, ancient Slavic spirits and ancient Ukrainian spirits, we treated them, whether it's the forest Mm. spirits, the house spirits, the spirit of the bathhouse or whoever you would give an offering just so that you would be protected. If you and the spirit would be okay, you know? Yes. It's interesting you bring up the spirit of the bathhouse because are you familiar with the film Spirited Away? I imagine yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. And I feel like the main witch of the bathhouse feels more of like a Baba Yaga spirit than it necessarily does a Japanese folkloric witch, though I could be completely ignorant about that myth space. Yeah, I don't know about the connection there. Although, you know, we see variations even going up into Siberia and into the more Asian cultures. And we see some references to Baba Yaga like characters and the stories and legends there as well. So it's Mm. conceivable that they could be related in some distant way or that the writer of Spirited Away, that they came up with that from that. It could be anything, you know, I'm not sure where that connection comes from, but it's super intriguing. And now I want to do some more research. (laughs) Yes, I love a bath witch. So I had to ask. But I want to loop back to this idea of Baba Yaga as a trickster. And in the book, you write, tricksters are actually teachers. Like all the best teachers, she is indirect in her approach, offering the student puzzles that seem mysterious in the moment, but elicit the most profound flashes of brilliance in the end. That is so beautiful because to your point, I think she is sometimes positioned as being a trickster just to like fuck with you. But here you're like, no, 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 no. This is part of an initiatory process and she's trying to help you grow, right? hundred percent. It's very interesting as a devotee of Baba Yaga, some people are like, why are you devoting yourself to this person who eats children? Are you <laughs> evil? Or you know, they go into all kinds of judgment about it because they don't know the whole story. And I will say from experience that when you work with her, she's like the toughest Olympic coach who sees you as the Olympic athlete Mm. knows you can make it into the Olympics and knows that you can get the gold medal even more than you know that you can get the gold medal. Mm. And a tough coach will push you harder, will make you cry. You'll be mad at them. They'll drive you insane. But when they push you, they do it because they know that you have what it takes to achieve the goal. So this book was that for me when I really started diving in deeply with her and I wanted to write this book with her. I cried Uh (laughs) many times. Uh I felt like oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? (laughs) What am I doing here? There was a lot of moments that I felt like I couldn't go on or I couldn't even write the book. This was really extreme. I had to learn to read Cyrillic. I had to learn Ukrainian. I had to learn so much and then do research in other languages. It was cuckoo. That's a lot. (laughs) It's bad enough in English, but when you have to start going into languages that you're not super familiar with, it's really tough. So it was a very challenging experience, but Then I started to realize what it was. She's pushing you because she knows that you can do it. Not because she's trying to thwart you, not because she's trying to test you just for fun, but she's trying to push you to limits and beyond your own perceived limitation to get to greatness, to achieve a goal that is an impossible dream. Mm. So when people are like, oh, I want to be a devotee of Baba Yaga too. How do I do it? I go, well, before you go in, I want to give you a warning. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like, and I think the best analogy is it's like, like that Olympic coach that's going to yell at you, scream at you, push you, make you do things you don't want to do in terms of working out or whatever, but that that's what gets you to the gold, right? (gasps) Yes. Oh my goodness. I love picturing her as like (laughs) a literal Olympic coach. It's making me laugh. I feel like there's like some animated series like in your future. Now, listen, I want to know, she is somebody that you've been working with, it sounds like, on a spiritual level. Can you talk a little bit about how you knew that this book was going to be your goal? 
Like, when did you conceive of this book and what is your intention for the book? How do you even describe it to people? As being second generation Ukrainian and being someone who really had some of the lore and some of the magic and spell work and all of those things passed down, but cloaked in Catholicism way because we're raised Catholic. It was a little bit diluted and I didn't have references for things. And like you, I'm a big researcher. I love looking up things. I love learning more. I'm a constant learner. I have a very bad book problem where I have not enough shelves and too many books. Yeah. I'm sure you can relate. Same, same, same. (laughs) So I love researching, love looking into this. And so it really kind of started long, long, long ago when I was a little girl, my mom would tell me stories about my grandmother doing these healing work. I mean, really, if you want to get to the core of when the spark hit, and I talk about it in a poetic way in my introduction, but my grandmother died before I was born. And my grandmother used to do what we would call znaharka work, which is healer. She was a healer. Another name for that is Baba Sheptucha, which means a a grandmother whisperer. They whisper incantations into objects and they whisper on people and do cleansings and clearings. My grandmother died when my mom was in her early 20s. She was very young. So she didn't really get to have a long relationship with her own mother. She would describe things that my grandmother would do. She said that my grandmother, for example, would hold a bowl of water and pour beeswax into the water and then was doing like a healing and a fortune telling thing. And in the pre-internet times, I couldn't find anything about this. When the internet hit, I got very excited because I thought, oh, now I can find a little thread of this. And I would look and I would look and I'd look. And I found things like there's a St. Andrew's divination where you pour candle wax through a keyhole into water. And then you hold up the shape and you hold it up to a light source and you see what shadow it makes. And that predicts who your husband's going to be on Mm -hmm. St. Andrew's day. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, that sort of is it? It's Slavic it's Polish. It's not, but I go, it's not really the same thing that my mom was describing. Well, what happened was my friend, Katie Carpets, who's a a Ukrainian Canadian. She's a witch as well, has a shop called the witchery up in Canada. And she had a book called the word in the wax. And I looked at it and I said, it was for sale in a shop. And I go, Oh my goddess, this is the book that I have been looking for because it is about the wax healing method. And this is the thing that my grandmother was doing. And so many of these stories of things are so deeply hidden. There's no references. Mm -hmm. It's not like Celtic magic where you can, or Italian magic, where you can find lots of great books written by lots of great authors. There is nothing about Slavic magic because Soviet Union, 80 years of oppression and no word of it getting out. So that's part of it. Yes. Before you go on, I have to interject because I recently learned that My ancestry is Jewish, so my family hails from roughly like Poland, Austria, Russia, that region, and yet very much Jewish ancestors. And I recently learned that there was a role that people had in Jewish communities in that area, and this is a Yiddish word called absprecherin, and the absprecherin was essentially like a witch, a healer. And one of the things they would do is take a bowl of water, hold it above someone's head, pour candle wax into it, and then they would read the wax almost like reading tea leaves. And that would tell them some kind of diagnostic system to know what was going on in the person's body or if the evil eye was on them or what kind of cures or magic that person would need. And, you know, we're talking roughly-ish the same region that you're talking about. And I wonder if it's the same thing or if there was some cross-pollination between these different communities. Because countries are made up, right? Borders are just invented lines and people are less boundaried than countries are. A hundred percent. I'm sure you've seen the book Ashkenazi Herbalism. Have you seen that book? Not only have I seen it, I interviewed the authors as a Witch Wave Plus episode. And that book for me, like, brought tears to my eyes because I was like, oh, I couldn't find any of this information about my own ancestors. And just these pieces kind of slot into place in your heart when you finally connect to wisdom that you think was lost. And it sounds like that's what you are helping to resurrect through your own work, too, with your ancestors. Yes, 100%. And that book, when that came out, I was so overjoyed. It was so beautifully researched. And this is what's interesting, too. 
in the village. So my grandparents came from a small village and in that small village, there was Jewish people, Polish people, Ukrainian people, which were Rusin people, the Ruthenian people was pre Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So they all intermixed and mingled. And when my grandmother immigrated to Philadelphia as a teenager, she had lots of interaction with Jewish healers and that connection, it wasn't so divided as we might believe or think or imagine, especially I think in these small villages where everybody knew everybody, you all shared information. Yes. So when I looked at Ashkenazi herbalism, they talk about the wax healing ceremony and they talk about both people doing it. The herbs that they use are like identical and what's going on. So everybody's sharing information. It's like, nobody cared if you were Jewish, if you were Greek Orthodox, if you were Roman Catholic, you all just shared information. You were in a little village with maybe what, 200 people. So everybody shared. That's exactly it. And I'll also add that our name, Pamela, as you probably know, sometimes translates to all honey. So I have this deep connection to bees and beeswax and candles. And so the idea that you also gravitated to wax as your entry point just like gives me the shivers. Yeah, it's a beeswax. Oh my gosh, we could have a whole podcast episode about beeswax. (laughs) Beeswax is super sacred and so amazing because what people don't know is that bees produce the wax, but they need to travel and get honey and do all the things. It takes a million trips to make an ounce of beeswax. Mm -hmm. You've got an energy of flowers of the bees themselves who are so magical. In Ukrainian magic, we see them as messengers of God would be the more post-Christian, but messengers of the divine. Yes. That's who bees are. So they're very traditional. Like this is women's work and this is men's work. And we know how that is, right? Yes, yes, yes. But there's a designation. It was always the grandpas who took care of the beehives and the really good beehive keepers were called bee keeper magicians. Mm. And they would whisper to the bees, put pesunky, the decorated eggs beneath the the hives to bless the bees. They had this very intimate whisperer connection. And this was the male magic in Ukrainian folk magic. This would be the male magic. You could work with the animals and with the bees. And that was the men's magic that they would do. Yes. Magic wasn't just for women. It wasn't that, but you had the women's work and you had the men's work and the men's work was the beekeeping. Oh, I love that. Okay. I completely derailed us. I feel like it's okay (laughs) because it's my show, but let me get back to the story of you connecting to this Ukrainian magic and figuring that you need to write this book. So once I found this book, it was the key that opened it up. And I really do, I have, I do a lot of ancestor work. I'm a spiritualist animist, which, so I'm constantly working with spirits, constantly working with ancestors, not so much deities. It's not my thing so much. Maybe Mm -hmm. that will change. I've gone in and out of that at times, but I see life force and everything. And I go back to the oldest, oldest animist ways is like, that's my juicy spot, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of tradition as you'll probably have, you know, understand in like Jewish tradition, there's a lot of like mother to daughter, grandmother to da- granddaughter kind of passing on of things. So for a Baba Sheptucha, which is the grandmother whisperer, it's often passed to the daughter or the granddaughter. I'm completely convinced. And my grandmother's like, okay, you're my granddaughter. We need to make this happen. I'm not in physical form to teach you. So I'm going to lead you to the places that are going to teach you. And so when I got that book, I got very ignited because now there was just one little sliver of information about this work that my grandmother did. That inspired me to look more and more. I looked deeply into symbolism in Pesanki, which are the decorated eggs in yes. Vishivanki, which are the embroidered blouses. There's all kinds of magic there in the food, which is such a huge part of Ukrainian and Jewish, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) food is everything, right? We're always giving, feeding up, feeding, feeding. I mean, there's just so much magic that is that lore. And I'm telling you, you're going to see things in my book. You're going to be like, Hey, wait, we do that too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think that's so beautiful. And that's one of the things that I say in this book is that there's Baba Yagi, I guess you would say, not Baba Yagas everywhere, all throughout Eastern Europe and in Slavic countries. Even going into Central Europe, we find correspondences, but really she has many, many sisters. She has Jewish sisters. Mm -hmm. She has probably Roman Catholic sisters. She has all kinds of sisters. If we look in those cultures and we go back far enough, we can find so many things. And so many of these practices are not exclusive to Ukraine, but this is the Ukrainian version. And so I'm sharing the Ukrainian version of Baba Yaha, Baba Yaga. So, yeah, I love that. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Zoo's Incense, who make some of my favorite incense on earth. 
I love that Zoo's Incense is an all-natural, handmade product, and that all of their ingredients are organic or wild-crafted using whole plants, seeds, roots, woods, tree resins, and tinctures. Zoo's has nine incense blends currently available, and each one smells like a sacred temple. They also now have monthly incense subscriptions for you incense heads, and these are discounted over their regular prices. Zoos also offers incense making kits for your own incense crafting experiments at home, and they now also offer gorgeous hand cast concrete burners, as well as charcoal, raw aromatics like frankincense and myrrh, and incense supplies. And on top of all that, Zoos also offers seasonal incense making workshops online, and you can keep tabs on that by checking out their website. Now, I adore Zoos incense so much that I've collaborated with them on my very own Witch Wave incense blend, which is inspired by my matron moon goddess Artemis and contains sandalwood, orris root, myrrh, black storax mugwort, ambret seed tincture, and organic ylang-ylang essential oil, and which smells like nectar and ambrosia. The Witch Wave blend is available exclusively in the Witch Wave shop at witchwavepodcast.com slash shop, so be sure to check that out. And you can find Zuz's other bewitching blends, such as Sunsmoke and Bacchus, on their website, which is zoosincense.com. That's Z O U Z incense.com. And best of all, promo code WitchWave gets you 10% off of orders from their site. And if you are ordering from their site, you'll also get free shipping on orders over $35. And this works with the WitchWave promo code too. So, Go ahead and check them out at zoosincense.com and use promo code WITCHWAVE for 10% off. I am a big fan of therapy and have seen firsthand how much talking to a professional has helped me manage my own anxiety and stress and trauma so that I can live the fullest life I possibly can. I've also seen how it's changed the lives of so many people that I care about for the better as well. And that's why I am encouraging you to check out BetterHelp, which is an online counseling service that can provide you with your own licensed professional counselor to talk to via video or phone sessions. And it doesn't have to be that heavy of a topic. Maybe you just need a place to be heard and have an outside perspective on your everyday struggles with your job or your relationships. We all have so much that we're carrying with us these days between our personal issues and, need I say, global issues. And it's just a lot. And I'm telling you, talking it all through with someone who is trained and objective and not a friend or family member is such a gift because their job their actual job is to listen to you and help you work through your feelings about it all so please consider reaching out to the folks at BetterHelp, and they'll connect you with a counselor who you can start chatting with in under 24 hours and they've been doing remote sessions since before it became the norm, so they've built a platform that's accessible, convenient, and secure. Also know that BetterHelp offers financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it really easy to switch counselors so you can find one that you truly click with. Best of all, Witchwave listeners get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. Please take care of your mental well-being. It is so necessary, and there is absolutely support out there for you. 
Do what over a million people have done already and head on over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. Find a great counselor to talk to and know that I am here rooting for you. Feel well and take good care with BetterHelp. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Madam Pamita. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into this book because I think the structure of it is so interesting. Every chapter, you kind of break into three components, and I would love for you to walk us through that structure a little bit. Well, this is, I have to say, also very channeled and inspired because you know very well intimately how books change. I mean, your proposal for a book is nothing like the finished book ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so books really do have a life of their own. When I started this book, I thought, well, I'll have a chapter explaining Baba Yaga to people, and then I'll have a chapter about this and a chapter about that. But when I started to try to even attempt to write the chapter about Baba Yaga, I'm like, how do I fit all of her stories or the essence of who she is into one chapter? It's just not going to fit. It's not Mm going to fit. And then I got the inspiration of adapting and bringing in components from many different stories about her around a loose framework of a story called Vasilisa the Brave, Vasilisa the Beautiful. Yes. We have different versions, different names for it. But this is one of the tales that's really popular and really well-known, basically about a little girl who goes to meet her and then Baba Yaga works her really hard and then she gets a gift at the end. That's the essence of the story in in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. So I used that framework and then I added in components that would demonstrate the magical component that I needed to bring out. So the way the book is structured, it is exactly in three parts. Each chapter starts with an episode of that story, that fairy tale to really immerse you in the culture. I think that fairy tales and stories really teach us something and show us something and make the information come alive in a way that just a dry recitation of something doesn't really do. So it starts out with this episode of this fairy tale, the story, this fable. And then from there, we have Baba Yaga speaking herself about the traditional magic that's associated with whatever component is the feature of that episode. Mm -hmm. And then I come in and I say, hey, witch, I'm going to show you how to bring this into modern day culture, because some of these things you can do, but some of these things um, may not really translate into modern culture, or how can you bring it into your magical practice? So I'm the real practical one at the end. It's like, hey, here's a little step-by-step showing you how to make a motanka, which is a doll to protect yourself or bless your home. Mm -hmm. Or here's a way that you can connect to the woods and work with the spirits of the trees, because we're talking about the Lisovic, who's the forest man, the forest spirit. By doing that, we have this sort of fairy tale thing that really draws you in and entices you and gives you a really rich experience with Baba Yaga. And then we have her telling you, hey, kid, let me tell you how it works. <laughs> and yeah. then I come in and I go, okay, all right. She just told you, I'm going to show you how you can put it into your magic. Yes. And so I give directions and explanations yes. and things like that. Yes, yes. And each chapter kind of focuses on a different type of magic. And for me, it felt very feminine of the world of women. And I use that word as expansively and inclusively as possible. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Did it feel important for you to focus on the feminine sphere, you know, the home and the nature that surrounds one's home? Or do you see this as being even more expansive than that? But you were asking that question. It really brought a connection in my head for a second, because I realized that the story that I wrote has a cousin in some of my favorite books, which are the Oz books, the Wizard of Oz and all the Oz books that followed that. Ah, the best. Such a matriarchy. First of all, I named my cats Glinda and Ozma. I have two cats. Ah, Perfect. (laughs) I, I saw one of them on screen earlier. That was Glinda. She's, she's my witch teacher. She's not my assistant. She comes in and tells me how it's done. She's a human (laughs) that reincarnated into a cat and she's was a witch before. And she's always overseeing my work and judging me. So (laughs) amazing. I hope she thinks the podcast is going well. (laughs) Yeah. She seems to be thinking so, so far, you know, L Frank Baum was a huge feminist. His mom was a feminist who was a suffragist and, you know, it was a really, Oh, you're talking about his mother-in-law, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. She's the best. Yes, 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 yes. So he was an enlightened man. 
he was really ahead of his time. And we see so many great feminist characters in his books. And of course, people are very familiar with The Wizard of Oz and Dorothy. And here's this girl who very bravely goes and creates this adventure for herself. And she has help, but she's the leader, right? This girl is the leader. It's interesting because the stories, there's lots of stories of Baba Yaga. There's lots of stories with male figures, male heroes, but I'm really attracted, of course, to the female heroines. They're just more interesting to me. And I like that archetype because it doesn't exist in a lot of our stories and legends and so on. Usually we have the princess who's the victim and the strong knight comes and climbs the tower or kills the dragon or does whatever. And so having a story where the girl and her resourcefulness is what wins the day is so interesting and exciting for me. And I'm a lifelong feminist and a woman. And so, yeah, if you want to get into feminine empowerment you can't get more empowered than Baba Yaga, <laughs> right? You know, she's yes. badass. I mean, she's, she not only envelops feminism, but also age and empowerment in age, which is really rare in our culture to see any stories of empowered older people and particularly empowered older women. So having this wise, powerful crone figure who's there teaching and initiating a young girl into magic is really the story. That's the story. And that's what many of the stories with her and the girls in her story. So I am, I go on in depth about that and look at that in the story that I created around these other folk tales, the sort of variation that I created. So Vasilisa is the Russian version. Vasilina is the Ukrainian name. So I changed her name to a Ukrainian name. And that was the bones of my story and then built up on that. That's how that came to be. But it wasn't intending to be a feminist screed in any way. It was just something that is part of who I am and part of what I'm interested in and gets me excited and just sort of came out in the book. We can't help ourselves, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm also so impressed by how much of the magic in this book, and I'm talking about the magic that you, Pamita, are instructing us, the reader, in. A lot of it is domestic magic. It's the magic of craft, of cooking, of embroidering. And that always moves me because I always think about how feminine magic and feminine crafts have been so devalued and masculine magic of like hunting and war and, you know, all of that is so, in my opinion, overvalued. And so I was so moved by the idea that every item in your witch's house is magical. The ladle, the clothing, the fabric that they put on their altar or wrap a baby in with all these magical embroidered symbols. Like every inch of home is imbued with this deep, rich magic. And I, I just find that so inspiring and so moving. Yeah, I think for me, my goal is to live a magical life. And this is not something that we're evolving to. It's something we're going back to. Because if you look at Ukrainian magic in its traditional form, it's taking everyday items, things that you'd come in contact with, and make them both useful, beautiful, and magical. Those three things are part of every tool, whether it's your spoon, whether it's your mortar and pestle, whether it's your clothing, whether it's your house itself. Every single part of your home, every single thing that you would touch would be imbued with magic. So we can sort of come from our spot of where we are now and think we're getting more magical or we're becoming more magical, but we're reviving something that was part of everyday life for our ancestors, you know? Mm, so beautifully said. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. The Path 365, Daily Direction for Ladies and Mothers, Witches and Others, is a book that allows you to open your mind, body, and spirit to a path that is uniquely yours. As a gateway spirituality guide, it weaves coping mechanisms identified in neuroscience and mental health that address mind, body, and spirit, and incorporates them into an easy-to-read daily guide. Author Susie Newell received her doctorate from the University of Cincinnati with a focus on coping mechanisms. This book gently encourages people to open their mind to a spiritual path that feels right for them. Like a daily oracle read for the soul, 
The Path 365 takes you through a journey of positive self-discovery and encourages you to incorporate your practice into every aspect of your being. Whether you have a solid spiritual practice already or are exploring your options, The Path 365 is a unique guide to creating a path of your own. Visit them at thepath365.com for ordering options, and be sure to use code WHICHWAVE for free shipping. And you can give The Path 365 a follow on your favorite social media platform. We are all in this thing together. Create a path that works for you. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Madam Pamita. So you brought up earlier this notion of eggs. And I know that Ukrainian decorated eggs is such an icon of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian folk magic. When this episode airs, it's going to be the beginning of April. So, you know, spring, fully springing, of course, Passover and Easter and all these other eggy holidays are on the horizon. So what can you tell us about these magical eggs? This is a passion of mine. This is a super passion of mine. So egg magic and decorated eggs go back to Trapillion culture. Trapillion culture was the culture that existed in Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, I believe, Kukuteni Tripillion, sometimes it's called. And this culture existed from 2000 BC. Don't quote me on the exact dates, but around 2000 BC. So we have these eggs and egg designs that really fascinating the idea that there's these ancient talismanic eggs that existed before Jesus even existed. So it's not an Easter thing. It became subsumed under Christianity because they couldn't get rid of it. So what do they do? We say, oh, okay, well now we're going to make eggs part of Easter. So this was part of the spring celebration. (laughs) Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So this was part of the spring celebration of welcoming back the sun, the yellow yolk and the egg representing the life force of the sun. And so working with eggs and egg magic has existed in many, many cultures. It's not just in Ukrainian culture, of course. We have pesanki, which are the decorated eggs. We have kreshanki, which are those single eggs dyed a single color, which are eaten. Pesanki are never eaten. The decorated eggs, they're used for magic only. The kreshanki, which are the dyed single colored eggs, are used by eating them. And that's what makes the magic. But there's lots of other spells that go along with those that don't have anything to do with eating. And then, of course, plain eggs as well were used in magic for cleansing. One of the fascinating things, oh my gosh, this blew my mind too, was that in Ukrainian culture, using a plain egg even as a tool for clearing and cleansing broki or uh, prichna, which are the evil eye and curses, right? Mm -hmm. This also exists in curandurismo in Mexico, you know? The limpia. Yeah. yeah. And so when I saw that, I'm like, wow, we, this is something that is so ancient. It's so ancient that Mm -hmm. people have been doing this, you know, way before written history, prehistoric times and so on. So this is something very, very old. The decorated eggs, the pesanki, which are the intricately decorated eggs are made with a wax resist method using beeswax on the egg. And you dye them in a series of colors every single time, adding another layer of wax so that the parts that you cover in wax stay the color that you had before and don't add the other dyes that you put it in. So it's like batik, you know, like batik in Mm -hmm. Indonesia, we have batik eggs in pesanki. So pesanki goes back to Trapillion times. Of course, pesanki were not meant to be like they are now. A lot of times people will make them and keep them year after year after year. 
but they were meant to be used up. They were consumable magic. So you would create it and then you would put it in your barn or you would put it under your beehive or you would put it in your home or you would give it to a friend as a talisman of protection and blessing. So we find that there are patterns that are still in existence, had total continuity for thousands of years, going back to Trapillion pottery even. They Mm. found an egg that's from the Middle Ages, an intact egg in Lviv in Ukraine. They found an intact pesanki. And they also have found ceramic eggs that mimic the pesanki, but eggs, you know, don't last. In prehistoric times, you're not going to find an egg that it has survived, but they're finding it through other means, like through these archaeological finds of the ceramic eggs and the, and the intact eggs, and also finding it in the pottery designs of the Trapillion culture, which is 5,000 years old. Mm. So this continuity of using eggs and using eggs as talismans has existed for thousands and thousands of years. And so it's really something that we can call them Easter eggs, but Easter is like a blip on the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? It's exactly. It's a baby. <laughs> it's a little tweenager. <laughs> so I want to get a sense of these patterns because you open the book with your first chapter where you talk about the magic of embroidery and stitches. And you talk about some of those patterns and symbols that are talismanic. Are the same patterns used on eggs or are there patterns that are magical and used exclusively for cloth versus an eggshell? There's a lot of overlap in the designs. We find a lot of overlap in those designs and the meaning of those designs. It's interesting because there are Pesanki scholars and one of them, Luba Petrusha, is an amazing one. She's got a great site. If you want to see ancient Pesanki and learn about them even more in depth, her website is pesanki.info. She's an amazing scholar and writes in English about Pesanki. So she says that the eggs were not meant to be read like a rebus. It's not like you're looking at one symbol and saying, oh, this means this, and this means this, and this means this. The symbols would have meaning, but you would see the egg as a whole talisman, not as, oh, I'm going to read it like hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics. Yeah. 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 So the same thing with the blouses, there are some things with color magic. There are some things with embroidered colors and there's things that we see in weaving. I mean, they all cross over all the arts cross over weaving, sewing and embroidery design of eggs. All of those things have a lot of the similar um, designs. You do have some differences in that you can, let's say, for example, with weaving, you're sort of limited in how you make a curve. You can't make a curved line very well in weaving. It's going to always be angular lines. But mm. in Pesanki, you can do curves. You can do all kinds of things. One of the most fascinating ones, I think you're going to love this one, is that mm. there's a thing called a vazon. It's like a pot with a flower in it. This is which shows up in embroidery. It shows up in weaving. It shows up on eggs. The Vazon is actually the ancient, 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 ancient oldest goddess, Berechinia. Berechinia oh. is the mother goddess, and she is the statue that stands above Kiev, right? That is Berechinia. Mm. She is mm-hmm. the oldest, oldest, oldest mother goddess. And so this Orante pose, which is the pose of someone standing with their arms upraised, that we see in ancient. Trapillion, ancient. I mean, if you look any of the Maria Gambutas books, you'll see these goddess figures with their arms upraised, right? Yes. Their arms raising yes. up like a the chalice symbol. We would do it in witchcraft. We would say, I'm making the chalice, right? So mm-hmm. this symbol shows up as the vazon, the flower pot in a lot of embroidery, but it's not a flower pot. It's a goddess. We see her sometimes depicted as a figure of a human, but we also see her depicted as this plant with its branches upraised. And so this symbol shows up in embroidery. It shows up in weaving and it shows up in Pesanki and in Pesanki, she sometimes has multiple arms and it's very stylized and almost like you can't even tell what it is. It looks like a a worm or an, I mean, you can't even tell what is a bug. It looks like something Mm -hmm. else, but if you start to do your research, you see these correspondence going over all of the arts, all of these ancient folk arts. And so it's fascinating. Fascinating. Ooh, I am weak in the knees. I am like all a swoon. I love that. So I want to shift gears just a little bit because as we're recording this, 
Of course, there's just a devastating war happening in Ukraine. May it be so that when this airs, that will somehow have, you know, resolved itself as peacefully as possible. At the time we're recording this, I'm not so sure that that will be the case. Regardless, I know that there are people who will be listening to us speaking, whose hearts are with Ukraine, and who, in addition to hopefully donating money, also may want to donate their magic somehow. And I wonder if there are certain spells, prayers, talismans that people can craft or utter in order to send protection and love and peace to that region. Well, it's interesting because in Ukrainian you know, folklore going back, we see the mother really being very revered, empowered, much different than American culture. You know, we don't see mothers being valued as much, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there's lots of mother goddesses. You can call upon Berhinia. You can call upon Baba Yaga. <laughs> I've been doing that mm -hmm. a lot. You can call upon Mokash or Mokasha, who's also mother goddess. There's all kinds of mother goddesses in that. If you are so inclined or deities or spirits, however you want to view them, you can call upon them to assist because that is beautiful. One of the things that I've been doing too, is really envisioning the grandmothers and the mothers of the Russian soldiers calling their children back home, call your children back home. Mm -hmm. Call your children back home because that's really what's going to stop this is that they have to want to go back and want not to do this stuff that they're doing that's really awful. So mm -hmm. I've been really trying to do a lot of influence work to influence the mothers and the grandmothers. They're losing their children as well. So one of the things that's really been helping me, I'm going to say this, when I'm getting anxious about it, I do start doing embroidery. I start doing cross stitch because I can really see that cross stitch as the protective talisman that I'm making for all of Ukraine. And so if people want to get the book in chapter one, it's all about embroidery, or they can even get a sneak peek at chapter one. If they go to my website, there's a preview. They can see the galley with the preview in chapter one on my website, mm -hmm. and they can start doing embroidery. That's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is to look at the sun because the sun shines down on all of us and look at the sun to shine down on Ukraine, to protect Ukraine. We can work in that way. I give sort of little spells that people can do because you don't, you know, not, a, we don't know where everyone is in their path or what kind of magic they like to do. There's so many different kinds of magic, sure. but pick a blue candle, blue beeswax candle and a yellow beeswax candle and light those to protect Ukraine, light those to resolve this and bring peace there. The color blue and color magic is of course about peace. And the color yellow is about success. Those two colors together. It's like, we want peace and we want success for Ukraine in this whole horrible thing that's going there. So we can do that. I mean, that can be a beautiful way to do a working. You could take, for example, juniper is a really sacred herb in Ukrainian magic for clearing and cleansing. So you can take a juniper herb bundle and burn it and smoke and cleanse and do it over a map, a printed out picture of a map of Ukraine to clear and cleanse all of this negativity and to heal the situation. You know, that could be another working that someone could do. So mm. yeah, there's lots of things that can be done. So those are just a couple little easy things to do. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So hopefully that will inspire people. You know, I've been doing tons of magic about it as well. You just really want to send your thoughts and your prayers. I have a prayer up on my Instagram that calls in the mothers. I call in the bear mother. Oh my gosh. Don't you want a bear mother as your ally? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. But more so I want Ukraine to have like a million bear yeah. mothers to protect them. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. So I have lots of prayers and ideas and on my Instagram, that's where my social arm, the most active, I have ways in lots of posts that people can help. And I think one thing that I really would say to everyone when we see something from across the world, it can feel very frightening. It can be create a lot of anxiety. It can create a lot of sadness and a lot of helplessness and powerlessness, but you can transform and transmute that energy into action. And if you take one action, if each of us just does one action, all those little drops can make a fabulous, 
beautiful, big ocean, an ocean of goodness, an ocean of positivity, of protection, of blessing for Ukraine. So here's what I would say. Do one thing. Your one thing may be to donate money to an organization, a humanitarian organization, or someone helping Ukraine. Fantastic. Maybe it's buying something from a Ukrainian crafter. Maybe it's going out and marching and protesting. Maybe it's calling up Nestle and saying, why are you still doing business with Russia? Maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe it's calling up your elected officials and saying, please do something about this. Maybe it's sharing a post. Maybe it's doing a spell. Maybe it's doing a prayer. Anything helps. Everything helps. Find the one that inspires you and do that one inspired act, whether it's a spell, a prayer, an action, a donation, a fundraiser. I had little girls in my neighborhood having a bake sale out in front of Whole Foods in my neighborhood. They're raising money for humanitarian aid for Ukraine. That is awesome. All of it counts. Mm. All of it counts. All of it counts. It does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I know that people are going to be inspired by your words as I am. And I also know that folks are going to want to learn more about you and how they can learn from you. You have an incredible amount of resources. Can you share with us the best way for people to connect with you and your magic? Well, my website is Parlor of Wonders. It's P-A-R-L-O-U-R because I'm fancy. <laughs> Excuse him. <moi. laughs> it's also because parlor without a, you was, is a magician. Awesome. Mag- magician, but not me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So parlor wonders is my website. I have a ton of free resources there. I also, one of my super huge passions is teaching along with writing. I love to teach the rest of this year on the first Sunday of every month, I'm teaching a hands-on workshop about Slavic magic. So the next one coming up is about Pesanki. The one after that is about Motanki, I think, which are the dolls, the, the talismanic dolls. So we've got mm-hmm. lots of great workshops coming up. I've got blog posts. I've got how to guides about magic. And of course I've got a big store with lots of beeswax candles and magical tools and things like that as well. My biggest social that I'm on, as I mentioned before, is Instagram. And there I am, Madam Pamita, all one word, no spaces, no numbers, no extra letters. None of (laughs) those are all the (laughs) no dashes, no dots. Exactly. You know what I'm talking about. No, lots of copycats out there, but there's only one original. If you want to know who, if it's really me, you'll see in the highlights, a thing that says scammers with a list of all the people copying me. So (laughs) that's all you'll know. It's me. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I need a spell against the scammers too. They've gotten to me oh as well. Gosh. Oh my yeah, goodness. Something else. We got to make some eggs against those scammers. <laughs> Get another job. Go somewhere else. Yes. Well, I am just so overjoyed that we got to connect. I can't wait to learn more from you myself. I just think you are absolutely exquisite and so fancy as we now know. <laughs> Madam Famita, thank you so much for being on The Witch Way. Oh my gosh, Pam. Thank you so much. We need to do something together. I know we're going to make some magic together. I know when I see a witch that I want to work with and wants to work with me. So, <laughs> Yep. So mutual and so mote it be. Thank you so much. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Madame Pamita for sharing her wild witchery and Slavic sorcery with me. And I hope you will all join me in donating to Nova Ukraine or another nonprofit that is supporting the people of Ukraine right now. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now by Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. 
You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.